This morning, turn with me to an Old Testament prophet. Open your Bibles, please, to Ezekiel chapter 18. Ezekiel 18. If you're using one of our Red Pew Bibles, it'll be page 1309, at least the start of it. Start of it. This message is a crossover from my personal devotions. As Brother Craig was saying just a few minutes ago, every day I spend time privately with God in Scripture and in prayer, and I keep a firewall between that and preparing sermons. The reason is this. I never want to let sermon preparation substitute for, for personal relationship, okay? I have, if you please, a job I need to do to prepare sermons for you. But also, I need to keep myself in tune and inspired and sensitive, listening to the Holy Spirit, how he would speak to my heart. So it's very rare for something to come from personal devotion over into message. This is one of those rare times. This is a startling passage in an unusual book. The prophet Ezekiel can be colorful, even extreme in his language and in his, his metaphors. Chapter 18 is simply amazing. It is like a chapter out of the New Testament has been plopped down in the middle of the Old Testament. And as we read, you'll recognize that New Covenant, that New Testament message. Now, since it is in the context of the Old Testament, there'll be some times when we need to bring it forward and make New Testament applications. But it is truly, truly an amazing passage of Scripture. So here's what we're going to do. I'm not going to read the whole chapter to you. That would not be a bad idea. I'll let you do that at home later. We're going to do the Reader's Digest condensed version here, and then I want to come back and talk to you about the context that this chapter comes to us in. So if you would, open your Bibles with me to Genesis, excuse me, Ezekiel chapter 18. Verse 1, the word of the Lord came to me. What do you people mean by quoting this proverb about the land of Israel? The fathers eat sour grapes, and the children's teeth are set on edge. As surely as I live, declares the sovereign Lord, you will no longer quote this proverb in Israel. For every living soul belongs to me, the Father as well as the Son. Both alike belong to me. The soul who sins is the one who will die. Then, through the prophet Ezekiel, God makes three examples. Verse 5, suppose there is a righteous man who does what is just and right. Ezekiel describes he is not an idolater. He doesn't sin against me by worshiping other gods. He's not immoral. He doesn't oppress others. He is good and kind and generous. Verse 9 at the end, this man is righteous. He will certainly live. Then comes the second example in verse 10. Suppose he has a violent son who sheds blood or does any of these other things. What if he is an idolater and worships other gods? What if he is immoral? What if he is cruel to other people and oppresses them? At the end of verse 13, will such a man live? He will not. Because he has done all these detestable things, he will surely be put to death, and his blood will be upon his own head. Third example, verse 14. But suppose this son has a son who sees all the sins his father commits, and though he sees them, 
he does not do such things. He does not eat at mountain shrines. He's not an idolater. He is not immoral. He doesn't commit robbery. He's generous with the hungry. Verse 17 at the end, he keeps my laws and follows my decrees. He will not die for his father's sin. He will surely live. Verse 20, the soul who sins is the one who will die. The son will not share in the guilt of the father, nor will the father share in the guilt of the son. The righteousness of the righteous man will be credited to him, and the wickedness of the wicked will be charged against him. But, verse 21, if a wicked man turns away from all the sins he has committed and keeps my decrees and does what is just and right, he will surely live, not die. None of the offenses he has committed will be remembered against him. Because of the righteous things he has done, he will live. Do I take any pleasure in the death of the wicked, declares the sovereign Lord? Rather, am I not pleased when they turn from their ways and live? But if a righteous man turns from his righteousness and commits sin and does the same detestable things the wicked man does, will he live? None of the righteous things he has done will be remembered. Because of the unfaithfulness he is guilty of and because of the sins he has committed, he will die. Verse 30. Therefore, O house of Israel, I will judge you, each one according to his ways, declares the sovereign Lord. Repent. Turn away from all your offenses. Then your sin will not be your downfall. Rid yourself of all the offenses you have committed and get a new heart and a new spirit. Why will you die, O house of Israel? For I take no pleasure in the death of anyone, declares the Sovereign Lord. Repent and live. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, as so often we ask, during this time, give us ears to hear and eyes to see. Father, may your spirit take off the blinders, take off that which keeps us from understanding so that we too might live. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Every passage is a part of a wider story. Every chapter happens in a context. And here in Ezekiel chapter 18, the context is particularly important. So, Brother Brad, we're on that slide called context. Thank you. So here's the context. Imagine that you were Americans, but you weren't living in America. Imagine that America no longer existed. Imagine that our country had been absolutely laid to waste from east coast to west coast. The cities burned, most of the population killed, and you had now been taken as a slave, as, a, as an exile to a country far away that spoke a different language. There you live in that faraway country. That's the context of Ezekiel. The nation of Israel sinned. They were idolaters. They had worshipped other gods, which was for their sovereign Lord probably the worst thing they could have done. They had been immoral. They had oppressed the fatherless, the widows, 
the aliens in their midst. And after sending them prophet after prophet who they chose to scorn and, and deride and ignore, finally God punished them with conquest and exile. The Babylonians and Assyrians fought against them and conquered their country. The word the commentators use is the population was decimated. Literally, that means like it's decimal. One in ten survived. And the scriptures are so graphic. The last king in Jerusalem was Zedekiah. He was a puppet king of, a, of the Babylonians, but he rebelled against the Babylonians. He rebelled against God. Jerusalem was put to siege, and when the city fell, he sneaked out of the city through a hole in the wall. But he was caught in the open field. He was brought before King Nebuchadnezzar, who brought each of his sons before King Zedekiah and murdered him in his sight and then blinded the king so the last thing he saw was the murder of his sons. Then he was placed in chains and taken to Babylonia. That was the fate of these people. And King Nebuchadnezzar sorted through those bare survivors, and he chose the best and the brightest, and he carried them into exile. Now, this generation in exile has this complaint. It reads like this. The fathers eat sour grapes, and the children's teeth are set on edge. Does that puzzle you just a little bit? The image is this. Dad eats something really, really sour, but his kids are the ones whose mouths are filled with the bitter aftertaste. What are they saying? These captives, these exiles are saying, our fathers are the ones who sinned. We didn't do anything wrong, but we're the ones who've been carried away. We're the ones who are paying, and it's not fair. It was our grandparents and our parents who rebelled. Now we, their children, we are stuck in this cycle of disaster, and we can't change it because of their sins we're punished, and we have no hope. And just to confuse things, sometimes this proverb is true. Exodus 20, verse 5, out of the law of Moses. God says, you shall not bow down to them, idols, or worship them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, punishing the children for the sin of the parents to the third or the fourth generation. Sometimes it's true. Sometimes the children's teeth are set on edge because the fathers ate sour grapes. How can this be true? Well, it's really very basic. Our mistakes affect those around us. When we lie, we teach our children to lie. When we are cruel, we teach our children to be cruel. You know, don't you, that most people who abuse their spouse, spouses grew up in families where spousal abuse was common. 
through cruelty, we teach our children to be cruel. When we're immoral, it's awfully hard for us to tell our kids they ought to behave. If in our personal lives we put God second, how will our kids put him first? See, see, here's the deal about idolatry. Idolatry isn't just chasing after other gods. It's having other gods as well as the right God, okay? So you can come to church every day, not every day, Every week. But if you still worship money or power or pleasure, and that's your God too, even though you're a Christian, that's still idolatry. Because you shall have no other gods before me. Sometimes this proverb's true. So what does Ezekiel mean? Why does he say this proverb isn't true? It's because we can break the cycle. Verse 20, God holds us individually accountable. The soul who sins is the one who will die. Doesn't matter what your mom did. Doesn't matter what your dad did or how they lived. You are accountable for your life. God holds you accountable. If we're righteous, we'll live. This first example about the the first generation, the man who did right. Verse 9 says, that man is righteous. He will certainly live. There's hope for us. But how about the second example? We can't rest on the goodness of an ancestor. This righteous man's son was a wicked man. It doesn't matter if your granddad was a Baptist preacher. It doesn't matter if your grandmother was a saint who took you to church every time you spent the night with her and you could see her reading her Bible before she went to bed. You can't rest on your ancestors' godliness. You are responsible. But we can break the cycle of evil. That's this third illustration, this third young man, he saw his parents' poor choices. He saw the evil that his dad had done, and he decided to live a different godly life. The cycle can be broken. You don't have to stay where you grew up. I did a wedding yesterday afternoon, just as sweet as it could be. And as I always do, I look past the groom and I look past the bride and recognize that they have a past good and bad, and they get to choose what their family is going to be. They get to cherry pick. I didn't like that. That was a treasure. We can choose to live godly lives. Ezekiel's answer is so clear. Repent. Repent. Verse 21 of our text, even the wicked can repent. Don't you just love this inclusion? But if a wicked man turns away from all the sins he has committed, he will live. You could start over today. 
you could decide today, I am going to forsake those things that I know in my heart are wrong. I'm going to forsake them. I'm going to turn to God. I'm going to live. In verse 24, for good can black backslide. You can make poor choices. You can pay the consequences. God wants us to repent and live. Please, please get this image of God that the prophet tells us. He is not hoping that we fail. He is not waiting to slap us down. His heart is full of compassion. He wants us to repent so we can live. That's his plan for us is life, not death. Hope, not despair. The cycle can be broken. What is repentance? It's turning from evil. Turning from those things that cause you shame. Turning from those things that in your own life you recognize, these are hurting me. Turning from those things in the scriptures that are so clear. Turn to God. And live. It's not just giving up the bad, it's receiving the good. It's finding life. And here is where that powerful New Testament application comes in. Jesus is the cycle breaker. All of us from Adam forward have been sinners by nature. We are bent to evil. We don't have to teach our kids to do wrong. Doing wrong comes naturally to them. We have to teach them to do right. Jesus is the new Adam. He breaks the cycle. He died on the cross to pay the penalty for what we've done wrong. And if we will repent and turn to God, we will be forgiven and we will find life. Not just life here, but eternal life. Jesus breaks the cycle. Repent. Turn away from sin. Avoid its penalty. Verse 31. Rid yourself of all the offenses you have committed and get a new heart and a new spirit. God wants to do more than fix what's wrong. He wants to change you entirely with a new heart. Jesus is the fulfillment of Ezekiel's promise. And he would have us not die, but live. Stand with me, please.